Welcome to season four of And The Writer Is. I am your host, Ross Golan. I've written with hundreds of artists and writers over the years, and my favorite part of each session is the first hour when we catch up about life, the industry, politics, composition, whatever. So this is a journey of learning why people write songs, how people write songs, and most importantly, who the people are who write the songs. I'm producing this with The Great Joe London, Big Deal Music Publishing, and Mega House Music Management. If you want to listen to the songs we discuss in this podcast, follow us on our socials, find out about special events, or buy some of our merchandise, go to our website, www.andthewriteris.com. Oh, and if you enjoy And The Writer Is, please rate and subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or whatever your preferred podcast listening site is. Welcome to And The Writer Is. I am your host, Ross Golan. Today's legendary producer, writer, philanthropist friend is a multi-Grammy nominated, multi-Grammy winning, multi-platinum selling mastermind. He's produced on some of the biggest albums in the past 25 years and most recently collaborated on the greatest soundtrack the UK has ever had. With a jazz, classical, musical theater background, This guy has reached the highest peaks in the pop world and doesn't have to apologize to nobody for it. With co-writers like Adele, Pink, Katy Perry, Celine Dion, One Republic, no wonder he's been so successful for so long. His recording plugins are fabulous. His writing camp in France is fabulous. His activism is fabulous, but he's most importantly a good father. All the way from Ontario, Canada, This guy co-wrote one of my favorite songs I've ever written, Small World by Adina Menzel. And the writer is someone who finally agreed to do this podcast, Greg Wells. Wow. I got nothing after that. I mean, there you go. And that's the end of the, We're done. the show. Thank you. Uh, so how does, a, how does a guy who's born in Canada end up here? That's sort of the... the First leg of the story. Um, you know, I think being dysfunctionally focused on a thing that I wanted to find and did, had no idea where it was. Explain. Um, I, you know, I don't know. I just sort of popped out obsessed with music, with rhythm in particular. How old? Like popped out of my mother, like you know. Well, um, no, I mean, I, I get the reference of popping out. I assumed it wasn't out of like a Jack in the Box situation, but like, <laughs> um, kind of was actually. But uh, well, yeah, maybe it was. Um, but I mean, <laughs> so, when do you know that? Oh, I'm actually when I'm banging on plates and I'm banging on tables. When is it that somebody says, "Well, if you hold these sticks." I guess you could use your hands anyway. But if you, when you hold these sticks and you put your this human in front of a drum kit, you know this person could actually play something. Like, how, how old are you when you realize, oh, this is music and not me just liking rhythm? Um, well, the message I was given when I picked up drumsticks was, please put them down. <laughs> and then if I, if no one said that to me, they would immediately say, please stop drumming. It's too loud. We can't hear ourselves talk about the weather. So this was really like, I mean, I really like walked backwards into all of this. You know, I didn't have it modeled for me at all. Like like my kids are having it modeled for them because they're interested in music. Um, But uh, yeah, my dad was like a minister in the, it's called the United Church of Canada. It's like a Protestant. It was like Methodists and Presbyterians and sort of the, that, and they all got together like 150, 170 years ago and formed this big umbrella thing. So that was what he did. And there was some music in the church, most of which I didn't like. You know, it was more like Church of England, like, oh, very, it wasn't like cool American, more gospel, more modern, more contemporary vibes. My dad would always say, like, the American churches really get it right, the music, they really get the music right. And it keeps the demographic of the congregation less, you know, gray haired. But he didn't really know how to pull that off. Um, he was interested in it. He knew, you know, we could see we'd get a lot of we got a lot of American TV. So there was music, and I enjoyed playing it. Uh, and I still, I mean, even as a as a mix engineer now, my reference is still sort of looking at the front of my dad's church, like the stage of it. I, I never pan things hard left and right. I want to feel like I'm looking at a at a performance in that venue. 
Interesting. So the not penning it far left and right, the idea that then you'd have it's it's as if somebody's speaking directly to you and that the whole band is much closer. I want to feel like I'm watching a really great performance. Yeah. I want to I mean it's so hard when, you know, with speakers like all we have is the sound. We don't there's no visual. As a minister, did he sing? He was a pretty good singer. Yeah, he loved to sing. What about your mom? Uh my mom loves music. Uh uh, but like wasn't you know I don't come really from a musical family. Sure, they like singing. They would sing like hymns and like really. Um, <laughs> there was a lot of like '60s folk music that that was became religious. We there were we had a few records by the Medical Mission Sisters, nuns playing acoustic guitars, and it we just used to make my skin crawl. Music. I mean, I'm, I'm you know no disrespect to them. It was not their fault, but for whatever reason, I wanted to hear like James Brown and. Uh, the Jackson Five, and so when I did, this is kind of answering your question from a couple minutes ago. Every so often, on the three channels that we got in the seventies, when I was a little boy in Peterborough, Ontario, <clears throat> there'd be some blast of like the Jackson Five performing, or Soul Train on Saturday afternoons, which I would watch. I would try to watch it every weekend, um, and that music just clobbered me over the head. And, took me over and I wanted to be on Soul Train as a dancer and um, and I didn't know what it was and that that aesthetic and that that music and that culture really was not around me in in a rural factory town very white you know were your parents I mean from your father commenting that American churches had it right musically and as a Jew, I can relate to that because we have the worst music ever, which is why we write Christmas songs. You know, it's like <laughs> because you know we also grew up with nothing, musically speaking. Um, all the Jews ended up being pop writers, <laughs> as you know that too. You know, so yeah. these these people were just grasping for any kind of music that wasn't what we grew up with. Mm -hmm. um, but in my case, I know my parents were really encouraging of the kind of music I was into. Um, for the most part, were your parents encouraging with the you know Soul Train vibe, or, or were they agnostic about the kind of music you were inspired by? I think they thought I was charmingly crazy. Yeah, they didn't. No one ever said stop dancing right. naked around the house at the age of five, <laughs> pretending to be Michael Jackson. But they were like, "Did you really want to dance though? Do you? Oh yeah. Do you dance now? Not at all. Terrible. Yeah. When did uh, just the vision of you dancing around naked is very funny to me? Like right now. Yeah. It'd be totally the weirdest interview. Um, it'd be like, wait, no, well, let me show you. <laughs> well, no, no. Um, <laughs> um, so, when do you when do you actually see this is this is a music teacher? Did you have music in schools? I mean, when when is the switch from oh, I like this to I'm gonna I'm gonna play? Uh, well, we we had an upright piano that uh, my parents bought. For three hundred dollars, it was used when they bought it before I was born, and that um, was in our basement. So I would pound on that. That was like my first drum set, and uh, then I started, you know, pounding away, like playing notes on it. Similar story to a lot of people that grew up with a piano in the house. And at the age of, and my mom taught me like a bit of like reading, kind of rudimentary stuff when I was in kindergarten, like five, six years old. And then we heard about a really cool piano teacher in my hometown named Marjorie Engels. And I started studying with her when I was seven. And half the lesson, 15 minutes, was like Bach and Beethoven, and the other half was Boogie Woogie. And I think she recognized that I was a frustrated drummer who didn't have drums. But playing Boogie Woogie was like a nice entry point into jazz. It was also super rhythmic, and I loved that. And it kept me going to her um, and then helped me get interested in, in the more classical end of things too, which I had no interest in as a, as a seven-year-old. But by the time I was nine, I did. And then got way, I was wound up, it looked like I was going to do that professionally, like be a concert pianist when I was 14, 15. And um, she started that whole path. When you're playing, you know, and I, I was a below average at best piano player. So I wasn't wowing anybody when I was playing school. I would have to sing something. Um, and I always admired the people who could sit at a piano whenever there was a piano around and just kind of rip and have people just, you know, it didn't, it doesn't seem to matter who the person is who's playing it. 
they feel the music and they they feel close to it. Did you find that being a, in a way, a, a prodigious piano player, you know, I've seen you play, so I know how good you are. When you were playing at 14, 15, you were like, this is probably where I'm going to go professionally. Did the other students and other kids and other parents in your hometown realize how unusual that is? Were they enamored with your musicality the way I kind of envisioned these people to be? I'll never know. I definitely didn't. Uh, <clears throat> it's such a sob story. It's like I should be playing violin while I tell this whole thing, but... I never knew I was good at music until I left my hometown. No one ever said to me, I, I could be wrong, but I really don't remember anyone ever saying to me, oh, you're really good at this. You should you should maybe consider doing this for your career. When I went to Humber College, which is a, a college that has a great contemporary music program in Toronto, then I started getting that message. And and I actually got, it, it sort of did my head, and I'm like, why, why did I, was I never told this before? I knew I was obsessed with music, but they didn't know there was a profession either. I mean, when I, the first one of the, one of the first people I signed as a publisher, I talked to their parents and I said, "You're used to hearing this incredible voice in your house, so you think that other people have daughters that can sing like that." But I'm telling you that that's a world class singer and writer in your household, and you're busy worrying about the wrong thing. You don't realize it what you have because you think your your child is like every other child. Your child isn't like every other child. I'm telling you that now. You know, and it like but I took somebody from the outside saying that to some somebody's parents. I know? remember walking in I might start crying talking about this, but I remember walking into uh, my dad's office at at the church that he worked at. <clears throat> and there was a guy who I'm still friends with actually just bought a Telecaster from him that is the guitar I learned how to play on because he would lend it to me all the time. And he was a musician, great singer, good guitar player, lovely dude. He was a school teacher. And he was a member of my dad's congregation at that church. And he was really supportive. He, like I said, he'd lend me, he'd lend me this beautiful Fender Tele all the time. And it's how I like, you know, began to pick up guitar. And I walked in after Sunday service to my dad's office just to like get my coat so we could go. And I walked into the two of them having a heated argument, which I'd never seen, like I'd never seen other than my own parents. I'd never seen like grownups kind of like, you know, voices raised. And, and I walked into this guy saying to my father, I can't believe you won't buy him drums. And then they saw me and they stopped and the conversation ended. But clear, they were both pretty ramped up at that point. So I think I know what happened. You know, that that was a guy whose name is John Crawford, um, who still lives in Peterborough, and, uh, and he had some objectivity, like you did, with with that kid's parents, where he where he could tell my father, like, I don't think you get what's going on here. Um, <clears throat> but that was really it. No one ever said it to me directly. When did you start composing? Like, I late, mean, very late. So you're because. The reason why I was bad at practicing was because I just would naturally just say, instead of practicing, I might as well just write something, you know? And the mindset of somebody who's playing the greatest compositions in history with you know, whatever classical background you have, and jazz. I mean, at least when you're improvising jazz, you're writing. You know, you don't realize you're writing. At least the, you know, the improv part is supposedly never been heard before <laughs> you know it's a, it's a yeah an emotion, oscar but... peterson would say that writing and improvisation are the same thing it's just writing is improvisation slowed down <laughs> yeah but sure. then you have the luxury of making yeah. choices too yeah. when did you start composing were you doing that in college at all i started a little bit in college but i was really such a sort of a monkey like just because i also i play a bunch of different instruments and i just was so excited to be around other musicians that wanted to play cool music. So I was just playing in, in every musical situation that I could have access to. Um, and they had never really thought about songwriting uh, and didn't really start songwriting until I was here in Los Angeles. And um, I wound up doing a lot of song demos for great older songwriters who didn't really play instruments. Learn, so, you know... 
as a producer, somebody taught you how to record music too. So, I mean, sort of a jack of... Not really. Two, no? I mean, mm. like, who? Uh, when do you start recording demos? I bought a Fostex four-track cassette machine, which I still have. Three of the tracks work. And, um, you know, I knew, well, okay, I need to buy a mic and a drum machine. Don't you kind of wonder who taught you that, though? I mean... A lot. I don't. The assumption is that you're just no, no. I'm gonna just figure this out, and you just kind of go to a music store or you, maybe you read on it. But it's not like you're surfing Google at that point. You're just figuring out. Oh yeah, I'm gonna get this recorder. I mean, where where do you think the idea of record? Not only do you study how to play instruments, but then to study how you record instruments is a whole other. It is technique. And it didn't come naturally to me at all, and it took me years to get even passably good at it. Yeah, it was like the, I was having so much fun the first several years of doing it, but the, the results were often just really inconsistent, and um, I just didn't know what I was doing. I had no one show me anything. I didn't know what compression was. I could see the EQ on the Fostex four track, and that taught me how to use EQ in a rudimentary way. And um, I had a little Alesis Microverb. It was the only reverb I could afford at the time, and uh, a AKG live microphone that was my vocal mic for years. You know, even when I was here in LA cutting song demos, but it was cutting song demos in LA that really taught me almost everything. Well, let's uh, you graduate from Humber, hum, Humberg, which is where Toronto, and then you go from at that point. You, you know, you start realizing, oh yeah, I I'm, I can do this. I want to be a musician. That's when you moved to LA. Being at Humber. Uh, at the time, it was a three-year program, and I did two years. And, and in the middle of that second year, um, I had a lunch with a really cool woman who unfortunately passed away a couple years ago. She was also from my hometown. She was at Humber as a jazz saxophonist, mm -hmm. Kira Payne. And we were having lunch, and she said, have you ever heard of this thing called the Canada Council? I'm like, nope. Um, she said, it's a, it's a thing that was started by... Justin Trudeau's father, Pierre Trudeau, who was the Prime Minister of Canada for most of the 70s and a bit of the 80s. He was an intellectual, he was a huge fan of the arts. And he started this government-funded thing where all kinds, anything artistic, you can apply for funding. Most people don't get it. You have to apply. It's a really exhaustive application. And it's reviewed by a whole like jury of adjudicators. And she said, you might be able to, you know, why don't you come up with an idea? Like, I want to go study in Los Angeles for a year. Why don't <laughs> right. you try that? Sure. So I couldn't get that out of my head. And I found the phone number in Ottawa, which is like the capital of Canada. And that's where the Canada Council office is. And I've got, they mailed me an application and I did a demo tape. I, like a, I had to compose four songs. I hadn't really done that before. They were instrumental jazz songs, mostly jazz-ish. Found a demo studio of our teacher at Humber, Mike Farkerson. He had a studio in his basement. I went there and just recorded them. I'd never done that before and sent it off with some letters of recommendation, said I wanted to come here and study with um, Claire Fisher and Terry Trotter. And Claire actually, who also passed away several years ago, lived really close to here. So I would come here all the time to this neighborhood and take piano lessons with him. Claire Fisher was a famous uh, jazz and classical musician who among a million other things, did all the Prince's string arrangements. Huh. So anytime you hear strings on a Prince song, it's Claire. Yeah. And, and Prince never told Claire what to do. He would just send him the tapes from Minneapolis and say, do your thing. And Claire yeah. would do his thing and send him back. And that's, that was their relationship for years. But Claire started recommending me for piano studio work for demos for songwriters. First of all, it's, it's fascinating how... Everyone has those turning points, but the fact that some people don't capitalize on those turning points and that somebody can say, hey, you should study in L.A., and you say, yeah, somehow that one stuck, so I'm going to go through this effort to do that. Because if I told you right now, you know what, you should go study in Stockholm, you'd be like, that sounds great, but I've got a family, I've got, you know, I'm, I'm not going to do that. But just that it's the right time with the right advice, if you take it, that could be... The whole the whole story can change like that, you know. So that's pretty amazing that you can pinpoint that moment because that's a big moment. Um, did you end up playing on any when you're starting to play piano on people's demos? Did you play with anybody 
or on anything that kind of exploded on any sort of national stage? Or was it all kind of you're playing on demos and people are shopping those demos for deals? Or what what were these demos for? Uh, The first session was a great singer and songwriter named David Lasley who... uh, had some hits with Anita Baker at some point in, I guess, the 80s or early 90s. David has sung with James Taylor for decades. Uh, David and Arnold McCuller have been James's background singers forever. And, uh, and David was this lovely, eccentric man who was just fantastic to work with. And I don't remember any of the songs that we played. It was so long ago. You know, it was like 1990 um, when I moved here. But then he called me again and I went back and and then I met some of his friends and I wound up working for them. And I'm pretty sure some of those songs wound up, you know, being placed. Um, and then after a few years of doing that, I got recommended to producer-songwriter Rick Knowles. And and lots of stuff that I did with Rick wound up, you know, being on the radio and and, and having a life. Um, and And watching Rick in particular was really informative, you know. Um just in every way, because Rick is really a, a, a very talented songwriter. Yeah. But he also, you know, does a lot of record production, and he's just, he would always refer to to the music we were working on as the record. He's like, play the record from the beginning, and I'm thinking, there is no, like, what do you mean? We just have, it's like a guitar and a scratch vocal. But he was, I love that he was always, at first I thought it was funny, but then I got it, like he's building a record. It's the record. We'll, we'll bring Rick back up later. Um, as... Uh... A, a a fellow musician in the community that really pushed for for legislation and who helped get involved for the Music Modernization Act. Shout out to Rick, our friend in common. Yeah, he sure um, did. He he did a lot of great work for the music community. So good on him. Um, when do you? What's the story from all the way from 1990 to you know when we start learning about who Greg Wells is? Oh man, um, just. Again, you know, this was like pre-internet, like we were talking about before the show, pre-cell phone. And I had no connections. I didn't know anybody. I'd never been to California. My family had never traveled here. We didn't know any, anybody at all. So I was really, other than Claire Fisher and Terry Trotter, the two lovely people I was studying piano with, I hadn't, hadn't met anybody here other than my neighbors at my apartment in Van Nuys, you know, hmm. on Magnolia Boulevard. Um, Not too far. Here. You know what it was? It was. A, do you remember the recycler? Yeah, sure. So before Craigslist, yeah, explain what the recycler is. There was like yeah. a, a, I think it was free classified paper, newspaper it would come out every week, and it was be just in front of like coffee shops, and it'd be in front of, it'd be at all the music stores. anywhere there was it a was newspaper a, stand. Yeah, right. Yeah, all, it was all over the place, and they were selling you know cars and whatever. But there was a huge, as you would imagine, in. In LA, there's a lot of musicians, and there's a lot of musicians that need to sell some gear to help pay the rent that month. And I was, I, you know, I remain one. <laughs> I remain one of those musicians. Um, and there were great deals. Like I remember getting an Electro Harmonics Micro Synth pedal, which is this really sort of holy grail, geeked out, cool guitar pedal for seventy five dollars. And the guy brought it to my apartment to, you know, to, to try out. Sure. It, was, it was a different world. So. There was a little mixer, a little line mixer. I had some keyboards at that point. I wanted to plug it into this rain line mixer. This is not very songwritery talk, but it all kind of, it's all the same brush stroke. I saw the, uh, there it was. There was the rain line mixer I wanted to get. That was the right price. I think it was $300. And I called. And this really nice woman, Shelly, was on the other end of the phone call. And we got talking and having a nice conversation. And I said, well, would it be okay if I saw, if I could just tried it to make sure it works? She said, yeah, you can come by the office. It's fine. I'm thinking, What? You have a mixer in your office? Yeah. And and I said, do you, do, you, do you mind me asking, like, you said you have the mixers in your office. Are you in the music business? And I was so excited, like I could barely keep it together. And she said, yeah, I'm a songwriter for uh, Almo Irving Publishing, and um, we have a writing room at, at their facility on La Brea. Come by there. So I was super excited, and you know, it's the Charlie Chaplin lot that is now Henson Studios. It was A and M at the time. All Herb Alpert and Jerry Moss. That was also Al- Alma Irving, and she was great. And I bought the mixer, and it, and we just stayed in touch. And then she started hiring me to come play on some of her song demos. 
I don't think I'm answering your question. No, you're totally answering it. I'm, I'm enthralled. She go, I mean, she says, she starts bringing you in on songs. And I mean, this is a big difference. That first time you go from, I'm in LA or any city where you're pursuing music, that difference of I want to be versus doing is everything. Right. So somewhere in that is, you know, when somebody in the business reaches down and says, come on in. Yeah. You know, you have this, that's, that is the, that's another one of those turning points just by keeping in touch with that person. I can trace you know? almost everything in my career back to that, buying that line mixer from Shelly Speck. Crazy. Who's now a lawyer. <laughs> do you um, still keep in touch with her? Uh, yeah, I do. Every couple of years I'll send her an email. Yeah. And, What's the first significant cut, in your opinion, for your career where you go from, where you have that moment of... As a what? As a writer or producer. Well, I didn't start producing anything till the very late 90s. So let's go um, with as a writer. My songwriting career began with a real sort of like, you know, Christopher Nolan, like Interstellar, just like, bam, oh my goodness, like literally from nothing to Aerosmith was my first cut. Um, and I had, through playing on a lot of these song demos, as a musician, you know, that that's the, my, my musician um, toolbox and, and, and whatever it is I do as a musician or don't do is something that has received a lot of attention all my life. You know, I've been doing it since I was a little boy. I guess the song demo sounded good enough for someone to, to ask, like, well, who's doing the track on that? And then I met... Um, Barbara Vanderland, who was a publisher at Almo Irving. I did not meet her through Shelley Speck, who was signed to Almo Irving, but I met Barbara, I think, through songwriter Mark Muller. Um, and this would have been like 95, maybe? Right at sort of at the end of when I was working with Rick Knowles. And Barbara said, okay, well, I get that you, you know, are you interested in being a songwriter? The answer was yes. And she said, well, I, I'm, I'm going to give you an assignment. I want you to do three different tracks. I want you to do one that's kind of like a jagged little pill, like Alanis Morissette sort of vibe. I want you to do something else, something like Annie Lennox's solo record. Just do, do a few different things. Show me what you can do with tracks. So I did. And one of the tracks was, uh, was actually me just getting a guitar sound on this little Zoom unit that I had, you know, simulating guitar amps. And and I was just playing a thing, just trying to get a sound. And then I realized the thing I'm playing was actually better than the song idea I thought I was going to do. I wound up doing that other song idea. But then I thought, I'm going to build a track around this thing that just appeared. So I did. And I think it was like six minutes long. You know, I had no clue about song form. Really, like just total indulgent muso, not thinking about song structure at all. And I gave that to Barbara. I didn't hear anything for a few weeks. And she said, one of these things I really like. And she played it over the phone. I said, oh, God, that was just like, that was just an accident. She's like, well, it's my favorite one. I'm going to send it to a friend of mine. So a couple of weeks later, I found out that Mark Hudson, Sarah's father, was best friends with Steven Tyler of Aerosmith. Mark got that track probably on a cassette tape. That was six minutes long. It could have been 13 minutes long, I don't remember, but it was way too long. And he chopped it up, put it into song form, edited the crap out of it, just my stereo two-track demo mix, and started writing what we would now call a top line over it. No one used that term then. And he was working on it, and he swears this is what happened. As he was working on it, Steven Tyler called him on the phone and heard the music playing in the background and said, what's that? And then it became an Aerosmith song. And I had to, I, Mark had to videotape me playing the guitar part to send to Joe Perry because Joe, who's a great guitar player, couldn't quite get his head around how I was playing because I sort of play guitar like a piano player. I have a weird way of doing it. I'm just self-taught. And uh, there was one thing that was tripping him up and I'm like, had to, you know, Crazy. send that yeah, to Joe right. Perry. And when I got to, the rough to mix. To Rock and Roll Hall of Famer Joe Perry, you're like, hey. It's oh, it's ab right, totally yeah. absurd. Right, like, yeah. You know, absurd. Yeah. And all my self-hatred and self-doubt was just like on 10, you know, go, what, this is all wrong, it's wrong, I shouldn't be doing this. But they did it, and it was produced by Glenn Ballard. And I heard the rough mix of that, and it sounded fantastic. And then Glenn got fired from the project, and they redid the whole record. And I thought, well, my song's not going to make it, but it did. And a guy named Kevin Shirley from Australia, he came in and produced 
kind of a raw or more rocky version of Aerosmith and the label liked that better. They felt like Glenn's thing was not didn't quite sound like Aerosmith. I thought it sounded great. And they were trying to like do a new but thing. But even just you know, at this point you're like legend Rick Knowles, legend like uh Glenn Ballard, legend oh, like yeah. these these are like the greatest the first some, time some Glenn of the best writers me. and producers of of a generation and you're just happening to be like you know it's just crazy because I mean it, it's easy in retrospect to say that because in the time you're just I'm just hustling hustling. No no hustling, no when Glenn when Glenn crazy. called me I almost lost bowel control yeah, right. you know <laughs> and I remember saying that within the first minute like I can't believe I'm speaking to the person that wrote Man in the Mirror yeah like I'm sitting in my little rent control apartment yeah. and just like what's going on you know and and Glenn was awesome Glenn really Glenn continues to be super friendly with me and supportive and um and he you know that felt like a big hand reaching down moment when when that came out because there's it's one thing when you start getting cuts it's another thing when you start getting aerosmith cuts you know when especially at that point because that's i mean that was a huge record so my next cut again yeah. again because of barbara vanderlyn was with celine dion yeah that's crazy and and that was and in, song. in their prime too it's not i mean not to say that they're not always in there these are, are legends they can put out music whenever they want but this really is like both of their sweet spots. Yeah, people were, you couldn't steal music yet. Or right. if you could, most people didn't quite know how to do it yet. Um, no, you couldn't steal music at that point. You yeah, I mean, the best thing you can do is copy a tape and then yep. you have to send the tape to somebody, then they have to copy it one on one and it takes too long and it loses fidelity and it's crap. Right. But you, yeah, I mean, the Celine Dion one, that's, that's crazy. And what year is that? Well, it's all Mark Hudson. It's all his fault. So he that's how we met was through that yeah. ridiculously indulgent cassette tape that, thank God, he turned into a song. Yeah. Um, and then he started asking me to come work with him. And he taught me so much. And we were at that songwriting event in France at Miles Copeland's Castle when I was not running it. I mean, I was like, I was, you know, I was a baby and everyone else there was far more established and, and usually much older than me. And uh, I remember it was the first day of the second time I went to it. And Miles came up to Mark and said, uh, who would you like to write with tomorrow? And uh, Carol King was there. And we were all just kind of talking. Mark just pointed to me and Carol. I said, these two. And I was like, again, bowel control became an issue. And I was just like, what is happening? You know. So the next day we were sitting in a room and I'd never met Carol before. And uh, I'd worked with Mark probably for about a year at this point. And, and he said, okay, so I'm very involved in Aerosmith's new record and they need a power ballad. Um, I think we're the team to write it. And we were all just like, okay, that's great. So to be fair, I really watched Carol and Mark write this song. Like I was 25 years old, I think, um, maybe 26, 25, 26. And every 10 or 15 minutes, I would sort of chime in and go, um, are you sure you should say fuck there. You know, I don't know if you can right. say that on the podcast, but are you sure you should curse? Like, you should it be, you know, or we're like, what about that one chord you played five minutes ago instead of, I would just sort of interject yeah. as a very shy, very, you know, unproven, quiet, anemic looking kid in the corner of the room watching these two veterans, you know, who have really strong pitching arms just like throw these 100 mile an hour yeah. speed balls. Um, and and we wrote a song called The Reason that was for Aerosmith. And uh, Steven Tyler loved it. The rest of the band didn't connect with it. Um, and the song just sort of was dying on the vine. And we played it for everybody and everyone passed on it. And again, Barbara Vanderlyn, kick-ass Barbara Vanderlyn, played it for engineer Umberto Gatica, who was David Foster's engineer for years. They had a meeting and she just thought, I'm going to play this for him just to see... And he flipped out and he said, you know who should sing this? Celine Dion should sing this. And it's kind of like a rock. Who sang the demo? Did Carol? Carol, Carol did. Yeah. Carol. I think that's part of the reason Aerosmith had trouble with embracing the song because uh, I remember at some point I heard from someone in the band said something to the effect that we, we can't sing a Carol King song. We're Aerosmith. And uh, it clearly <laughs> was designed for that's them. That's so but. interesting. I mean, considering that they've cut Diane Warren songs. That came, well, that was later. Yeah, right. Yeah, and that's their biggest song, actually. Right. So, you know, these are all nice problems. And um, and I remember Barbara called me and she said, Umberto Gatica is going to go play this for Celine. And I said, Celine's never going to sing this song. There's a, there's a line in it, it was very Steven Tyler. In the middle of the night, 
I'm going down because I adore you. I want to floor you. Yeah. Like Celine's not going to sing that lyric. She did, you know, and it was the same album that had the Titanic theme on it. It's her biggest album. And she's, I mean, it, people don't, rec- if if they've never been around her recording, they don't realize that she's funny, she's strong, she's, you know, she's a badass. She's not just this person who sings songs. She can, she's the person who runs the session in all the positive ways and everyone around her loves being around her. She's maybe the best reputation of any of the, quote, divas. You know, she just has this ability to make everybody love her. And she is, but she is no joke. I mean, she is, she is a strong human. And if she wants to cut that, that song and that lyric, she's cutting that, that song right. and that lyric. And, you know, that, that's really cool. I mean, that's a, that's a crazy album. I mean, to be on, that's it was probably nuts. 20 million albums worldwide kind it of. It was thing. way over 30. Yeah, that's it was insane. crazy. Totally and that crazy. you know, for you as, at that point, that goes from. I, I imagine you know, it's hard to explain not to jump forward to mechanical royalties and stuff. But at nine point one cents per song, that's you know, and thirty million albums sold. That's a you know nine nine hundred and ten thousand dollars in mechanical royalties alone per songwriter. You know, versus now a hit song. You know. On mechanical royalties, you're splitting thirty thousand dollars on streaming. You know, it's not even in the same ballpark. But I imagine when you have that, and just following, look, the Aerosmith still probably sold five, ten million albums worldwide. You know, you probably ended up having enough at that point to be, you know, to have a nicer apartment. So, like I said a while back, my songwriting career began with a real start. You know, yeah. And then it was years of total inactivity. Yeah. I could not get arrested. I couldn't, like I had no cuts. I kept yeah. trying, I was writing all the time. I wound up signing with Barbara Vanderlyn uh-huh. at, at Rondor. It became yeah. uh, Alma Irving, I think. I think I'm correct about that. They changed their name to Rondor. And I was with her for four years and I learned tons and met some incredible songwriters. And Barbara was hugely supportive and I'm sure it's all my fault, but I just, it took me a long time to realize that really, really good is just not good enough. Mm-hmm. I didn't know that. I was so excited to to get to work with, you know, people with careers that were talented, that knew a lot more than me. And because um, I love, I don't like being the best player on the team. I like the opposite. Yeah. And, um, but I think I had not, developed kind of a strong enough focus on how good a song has to be just to sort of show up on people's radar. There's a, a book I've been reading. It's literally next to my bed right now that I'm reading right now called Good to Great. And it's about these, It's just, now it's a 15-year-old business book, but it's it's something that songwriters and any entrepreneur can use. But essentially it, it discusses those the great companies, how they go... You think of as Chrysler with Lee Iacocca as a great company, but in reality, it actually it, it spiked and then it dropped, and it was all ego, and it was not necessarily these these companies who progressively build um, over time and can max out the market. All this stuff that is seems not relatable to what we're talking about, except for the fact that the through line. B- you know, behind the companies that are like economically great are are ones where the bar is set at a certain level and in the company the the culture is about doing your very best and doing it for the team and like you said, not be the smartest person in the room. Try to hire people who are are really great and let them do their thing. And it's all about, you know, the idea of building something great is is such a different thing. And as a songwriter, people are, we're, we're flooded with good. There's so much good. Any professional songwriter writes a good song every day, you know. But to do something great that can get in that top 40, when those songs don't switch every week, it's not 40 songs per week. It's 
it's like, you know, 200 songs a year get in the top 40. I don't know what the stat is, but I wouldn't be surprised if that's right or if it's less. You know, it's and most so people, few songs. Most people don't like most of those songs. Yeah, too. And, and even that, where we listen, and we even listen to those as listeners, and, we're, and we criticize those, right? Like, this song sucks, this song sucks, this song sucks. To be in that top five or the top one. And I have to remind myself that, like, for every one of those songs that we criticize, there's probably 10,000 other versions <laughs> of that song that aren't as good yeah. as the one we're criticizing that weren't just, they weren't good enough or whatever was missing to make it to occupy that slot. Does it give you empathy for other songwriters? Oh, and- it's the hardest thing. People think that our careers as songwriters, it's like we're just like, we've won the lottery. No, until you try and write a great song, no one yeah. understands how utterly masochistic and almost impossible it is to write a great song. Sure. Uh, the guy that owns Blackbird Studios in Nashville, John McBride, he loves to say, good is the enemy of great. Yeah. Which I that's don't right. think is originally his quote. No, Someone it's, from, else it's from that book. It's from the book, yeah, right. Yeah, that's course, the first yeah. chapter. Good is the enemy of great. Good is the enemy of great, that's right. you know, and and I think to really feel that in your bones, you have to jump into the cold, deep end of that pool and and try to write a song and have, and have, and empathy is empathy is everything. Empathy is enormously helpful to me in the studio. I think empathy is the thing that separates the brilliant businesses today from the non-brilliant ones. You know, empathy for your customer, for what like trying to. When I was making Greatest Showman, I didn't make the movie. When I was making the, helping make the music, producing and mixing the music for that thing, I kept trying to play with linear time and imagine that I'd bought a ticket, that I was sitting in the theater, in the audience, watching the finished film because I got to work to picture with that thing and thinking, okay, what do I want to feel? What do I wish? Because I'm always analyzing in real time when I'm listening to a record or watching a movie. Like, well, they could have, why didn't they do that? Or that was great or, you know trying to be an audience member. Yeah. Uh, I think that's how Rick Rubin produces records. If you start writing with respect for the listener and to understand that that person's a, an expert at listening to music and not try to dumb down your music to feel like the person who's listening to my music is probably stupid, that's, that's the first way your song's not going to work. But if you go and you actually respect your listener and you start giving them an experience where they're actually entertained, then I think you have a shot. It, there's got to be some sort of understanding of how someone listens to music to know how you write it. So, But let's go back to some of the story. You know, like you said, you had trouble sort of, you, you go from Celine Dion, then you have this kind of lull. You have some songs that come out, but it's really, you know, I feel like the the first like big single to be associated with was Apologize. Is that right, or am I missing something before that? You know, I produced Jesse McCartney's Beautiful Soul. Okay. And that was the number one song around the world. I think that was my first number one as a young producer. That was like early 2000s. Okay. Um, And I I mixed that one as well. Um, uh, Do you care whether you write it or not? No, no. The only thing I care about is if I really, really, really click with the music. Right. That's it. Uh, I, I, I... I don't really rate myself as a songwriter. I mean, I love doing it with the right people and on the right thing. And like, for instance, when you and I have written together, it's like, that's as good as it gets for me. Especially the first time we wrote, and then we got Small World out of that. That's one of the best songs I've ever been a part of. You know, your vocal on the demo of that is just one of the most moving. I cry every time I hear it. You know, if it was always like that, I'd, 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 I'd quit being a record producer and I'd songwrite every day. But I have, I'm a multi-headed beast, uh, ugly very ugly beast. <laughs> um, and so when I'm not producing... Except for when you're I'm, dancing naked around the room. Then it's... <laughs> I, there's no words for that. Um, I've lost the plot. What was that? Well, the we were talking about the, just the not, you know, being a producer and not writing. You know, that there... I find that right now in an era where, where the idea of producers are automatically songwriters and... But songwriters aren't automatically producers, but now it's sort of like songwriters are becoming producers. And it's a little confusing as to what everyone does, except for those, you know, I know Ian does it sometimes. Ian Kirkpatrick has been on this and Yuan Carlson. And there, there are a lot of people who are, you know, and you are, are relevant producers who are willing to produce records that they didn't write on. 
just because you love the music is it seems like an anomaly right it's, now. I think it's such a missed opportunity to not be open to that. I mean, some of my favorite movie directors did not write the movie. <laughs> right. Oh, and, I and, mean, and of we're course. like, well, of course yeah. that's true. Yeah. Well, hello. A record producer is like a movie director. It should. Re I think it should be called the record director. I think that makes more sense. I love that because it's directing a movie. There's no visual, but you're you're you know the buck stops with the record producer. And in movies, there was a delineation at some point between the movie producer, who was more right raising than taking care of the finances, and the movie director. And you know, in the collective public awareness, we're all kind of aware of what a mo movie director does. We kind of get it. Nobody knows what a record producer does because. With people like Phil Spector or George Martin, where the producer, who was more the business person overseeing things, making sure the train didn't go off the tracks, became more of a creative member of the of the record making process. And I wish that the term director had kind of crept in, like it did with movies. I yeah. think with movies it was probably always there. But I, um, a lot of the, you know, a lot of the records that I, I I've I've got my music on, I did write with the artist or whoever was in the room. Um, now a lot I didn't and, you know, apologize as a song that I fought really hard f for the band to record. The band didn't want to do it. I didn't write that. Ryan Tedder wrote it. And I'm not thinking, well, I'm not going to produce apologize because I didn't write it. Right. Like that is just, for me, that just doesn't work. You know, right. and the other thing too is there's all kinds of different records being made. Like there's more entertainment type records where you have a singer who actually is not a writer and has no point of view but looks great. And, you know, there's a young kid who just got signed to Capitol based on an app she was right. using where she was lip syncing. Yeah. And she got a massive record deal. Yeah. She's the hottest thing right now. <laughs> and she got a record deal not even based on her singing. It was just like she's lip syncing to someone else singing. So there's that kind of world, right? Where, you know, both you and I get called to work with that kind of artist. But then there's like, you know, a band like Family of the Year who's just writing like beautiful songs and I produced their new record and I didn't write with them at all. And I love what they do. It's sort of like a lot of my favorite stuff, like Elliot Smith meets Death Cab for Cutie. It's just like beautiful, amazing songs. And then there's you know, well, I don't need to categorize every record that's being made, but there's lots of different, sure. there's tons of bands that have a, huge careers that are never played on the radio. There's tons of acts that are played on the radio that can't sell tickets. To you I know. just think it's strange when people look at, you know, I, I like the movie analogy and I, I, I've said the thing similarly where you know, no one expects Meryl Streep to be the screenwriter. You know, Thank no, you. you know and, and it's okay, she's not asking for screenwriting credit. Thank you for that. She's not asking for a percentage of it. You know, it's not like yeah, her goons are not calling up right. And you, know, you never have Rupert a Murdoch and going, no, she needs you know script like story yeah. doctor credit. And I mean, it's just, yeah, and you have the same same thing where what, my my friends, a lot of my friends are in production for film and TV because well, we live in LA and that's what people do. And they give story notes all the time. It's all about story notes to the screenwriter. They're not getting any co writing. Just because they go and, you know, if I give, every time I give a note to one of my writers, if I went and started taking publishing, I would be, um, well, I would be some of the previous producers who did that. And I don't want to do that. You know, I think that that's not, that's not the spirit of what we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. You know, if everyone is, you know, what I like is that you, you keep giving credit where credit's due. And that takes, that takes a lot of, um, there's a humility that comes with being able to say, I didn't do the following things. They did this. But what I did was this. And to be very clear about everybody's contribution to a song, to make it, you know, and, and in, in the theater world and in the film world, it's so clear yep. what everyone does. And it's a more professional you know, environment. I mean, yeah. I'm sure people in the film and TV world might laugh when they hear me say that, but... I have a show that's opening in New York, right? And they, we were going over the contracts, and the contracts in theater are a hundred years old with legal precedent, o older than what we deal with. Most of our contracts are from essentially 1945 on, you know, like big band era. To right. Then you get into like really the 50s, and you get Elvis, and it starts to move towards actually moving units where we have to have protection against 
uh, shellac records breaking in transport. So most of our contracts and our legal precedent is 60 years old. But there's been professional theater in the United States since, you know, I mean, Lincoln was shot at a professional show. So these they had contracts at that time with the theater, the cast, the actors, the the sure. the costume designers, all that stuff. So there's a hundred more years of legal precedent in that world. You know, moving pictures is only a hundred years old. You know, for a commercial yeah. ability. So you're talking about these are really young businesses, and it's easy for us to. Um, to think, well, that's just the way it is. But, you know, 60 years ago, that's what we're talking about for the record business. 100 years ago is what we're talking about for publishing. 40 years longer than recording, really. I mean, there's recording, but as far as mass marketing, where they're selling, uh, you know, bobbleheads and lunchboxes, you know, it's, it's 40 years older. But it's just interesting. I think the, the way we define our business is still really young and we're still trying to figure out how to define it and you know on some level as much as I hate when when I use the word like I'm a top liner it's like I'm a songwriter I play instruments I write melodies I write lyrics I'm a songwriter but the delineation of saying I'm a top liner makes it very clear for when people are putting sessions together and I kind of respect that as I've gotten older, as much as I get annoyed with the limitations of that, I think there's some clarity with, oh, this guy primarily does lyrics and melodies. Mm-hmm. So let's not put six of those top liners in a room. You know, If you put three songwriters in a room, you might get the, the three top liners and nothing right, gets done. Right. You know? But you end up with, you, know, you produce Apologize, and really over those next few years, you apologize, especially the... You know the remix of it, and then having, you know, three years later being a part of the Adele album and Teenage Dream for Katy Perry. It kind of is just a trifecta in a matter of three years of sort of three of the biggest kind of projects you could be a part of. Does that change as a jazz, as somebody who's sort of trained as a jazz, as you said, jazz-ish musician at times, you know, classical, you're a producer. How does it change when all of a sudden you're kind of, now you're like for real a pop producer? Like I don't think people, people must have been coming to you for those, you know, that young that young artist signed on Capitol. All, all of a sudden all the pop projects must have come to you. You know, it must have changed how people view you, whether or not you change oh, yeah. as a person. I mean, I can imagine if, if you're selling in an era where people aren't selling albums and you look at those three and you're still like, well, that's 25 million, that's another 10 million, and that's another 10 million. You know, it's like you're still selling all these albums, but they're all, they're super, like, and they're the definition of, well, I think, you know, popular music. I, I mean, I know I can't, I can't fully speak for Katie, but I know that Katie Perry, when we met, uh, was really into the fact that I had produced Rufus Wainwright. Mm-hmm. And Katie really came from more of that hotel cafe, Ingrid Michaelson, Josh Radin, like singer-songwriter thing. And that's what she was doing when we when we met. She was doing some more than that, but it was more rooted in that kind of just, you know, she'd go on stage with an acoustic guitar and play a gig, just her. Which she can still very much do. I think she still has a moment in her set where she does that. So uh, I was definitely an outsider. I wasn't just viewed as an outsider in the pop world. I really was one. I'd worked with like Rufus Wainwright and the Deftones, you know, or OTEP, like a, a female fronted death metal band. Um, th- those are the records that I was very proudly making. And I remember Cara Diaguardi calling me, going, Can you come? There's this new girl, Ashley Simpson. Uh, and I'd be like, "Sorry, I'm I'm on a seven month OTEP record. I can't do it, you know." And uh, and I'm really happy that Kara met John Shanks, and that and the, they wound up doing a lot of that work that Kara, I think, was initially speaking to me about, yeah. which I couldn't do because um, I was you know stuck on producing long records that I'm still to this day super proud of and still friends with those artists. But um, it wasn't until that so I met a bunch of people in 2005. I I met. Um, Katie, I met Ryan Tedder. I met a guy named Marshall Altman, 
Yeah. Who Marshall, I think, is the reason that I met Ryan and Katie. Who Marshall's, I had dinner with him about a year ago in Nashville. He's really, that was a big, he was a big door opener for me. He put me into the office of Tim Devine, who used to run West Coast Columbia. And Tim put me in the room with those people. Um, I, I, you know, I'm very thankful to Marshall. And I remind him all the time when I see him, like that really was a career changer. But I, I was so sort of in the eye of whatever my little tiny hurricane was that I, like hearing you talk about it that way, I've never ever thought about it that way before. I really haven't. It's also weird when you're in um, all of us. It's now is very slow. It's really easy for me to say in those three years and call out essentially five songs, four songs that are that de- can define those three years in a lot of ways in a like a really positive way. But when you're in it and you're waiting six months for this song to come out and you're on mix number seventeen and it looks like it's gonna not make the album. Now sucks, but it's really easy to look back and be like, "Oh yeah, I sold twenty five million albums in in three years on these projects that I chose." You know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna produce this one because who would not produce Apologize? And here's Adele with Chasing Pavements, but really nothing after that. You know, this was the first album after Chasing Pavements mm-hmm. as a single, and then it goes from being like, "Oh yeah, I'll work on that," to it selling. 25 million and being uh, number one on the charts for 18 months or something like that. And then, you know, Teenage Dream sets the record for most number one singles by a female. And you're writing with this person when they're an acoustic guitarist and you're dealing with like, here's a singer songwriter and being close with the artist because that, that was your path. But the idea of, it's easy for me to say, Oh, in those three years, you also did that because we only have an hour to talk about a whole career. <laughs> right, right, right. But when you're going through those three years, it's working with an acoustic person who's signed a major, who's on, you know, whatever version of however many times she's sent in demos for them not to and, hear it, and they release stuff and it didn't work. And I got to point you know, out, apologize, got to, sorry, real quick, but like one republic yeah. gets dropped. And then they, you know, what, what Katie got dropped too. Yeah, like all these people are getting dropped. It's not like. It's it's easy now to say Katy Perry, Ryan Tedder, and Adele, but at the time, you're talking about somebody who had a moderate hit in the U.S. with Chasing Pavements, a band who just got dropped, and an artist who just got dropped. Yeah, Katie, that was Katie's third time she got dropped. Crazy. Third time she got. I had people in the industry saying, "Why do you continue to work with Katy Perry, who yeah. was 24 years old at the time? She's old news." Yeah. This is before one of the boys came out. She's old news. What do you do? It's like she, clearly she's trouble. She's been dropped three times. You're wasting your time. I was told to quit um, Mika's first album because he was too weird. And uh, you know, I was told by the team that took care of me at the time, like maybe do two songs and then get out. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, but I was just I wanted to say while you were saying like we're looking back in hindsight, going, well, there's that and that. that. I really do want to point out, and you know, it, it'll be obvious to us in the room here but most of what i did then and most of what i continue to do now never sees the light of day why all kinds of reasons most of what i do doesn't turn into a hit most of what i do doesn't even get finished because people are distracted and not everyone's got the wherewithal and the skill set to see something through to the end and have it show up in the marketplace, and then then once that happens, then things are really out of your control. Like sure. who who else released a record that week, and is the promo person at the record company going to chase the hardest, most you know, like the thing that they love, but doesn't sound like anything on the radio right now, or are they going to chase things that sound like ten other things on the radio so they can collect their bonus check, which comprises half of their annual salary? Right. What do you think they're going to do? So, right. you know. I can get really kind of cynical about this stuff, but it's just reality. And it's like, that's the kind of stuff we're up against. So that's why most of what I do and can continue to do doesn't have a life, you know, but I've worked just as hard on that stuff as I did on convincing one Republic to let me produce apologize for them. Well, and you were able to work on, you know, I know a lot of us had met with Dua Lipa and had worked with her, you know, and, she was working with Jeff Fenster at, at Warner and a lot of us, you know, spent some time with her. But an alto singer who's singing pop music, not really the most popular kind of female singer. Beautiful, smart, cool, 
all those things. But I don't know if you think at the time, you know, before somebody's a hit, signed to a label that was really struggling, I don't know if you think, okay, this is going to become the biggest pop star of 2018 either. You know, I mean, it's another thing where you just hustle and you kind of are like, well, who would have thought? Like, I'm really happy for her. She's a really cool person and that's a nice surprise. But, totally. you know, you just don't expect it. The one thing that I think you can expect was The Greatest Showman. I don't think you can expect it to be as big as it was, but um, Michael Gracie, the director, came into studios and essentially acted out the entire movie, to um, the whole the, scene by scene, passionately telling his story of what the movie was going to become. And if you were honored to be in the room with him during the introduction of what this what this soundtrack and what this movie meant to him, you'd be crazy to not spend time on it. And then to have Pasek and Paul, who had done. Dear Evan Hansen, and you know, obviously they did La La Land, but then for you to be able to work so closely with them on this project, that unlike these other ones, seemed like, well, if I have this opportunity, let's just not screw this up, you know? Or maybe I'm maybe I'm biased because I saw the process of it and was so enamored with those people, you know. But that seemed like the opportunity, you know. Of a one of those opportunities that in the end of your career you're gonna look back and say, yeah, I'm so happy I had was in the room for Michael, you know. You're right. The the meeting with Michael was so he is just so incredibly infectious and kind of winning and his his passion, and he's also a badass. Like, do you, do you ever remember? Do you ever remember what an Period. awkward? Uh, <laughs> No. That Evian really. commercial where babies are in roller skates no. and they're dancing, there's a disco ball, and it really looks like babies are in roller uh-huh. skates oh, dancing. Maybe. Yeah, okay. That's one of Michael's okay. early commercials. Oh, where? And it really looks, and this was a long time ago, yeah. but it was just no one could believe what we were seeing. Yeah. You know, He's a visual genius. Yeah. Uh, he's a genius at a bunch of stuff, but th- um, I knew that about him and I knew that he'd done that Evian commercial, which blew me away when I saw it. And I was really honored that he wanted to take a meeting, you know, about a movie he was making. He never directed a movie before. And you're right, the meeting was just so incredible and his his uh it was contagious. His the way he felt for the story and, and the movie. And I was like, I'm in. You know, I'm in. Of course I'm in. I never heard from them for another ten months and, and we just thought it had gone away. And it turns out that they had been told Pasek and Paul and Michael had been told that Greg Wells passed. He wasn't interested. And it was the opposite. I'm like, I'm dying to do. What are you talking about? Yeah. And I don't know why they were told that, but they all swear up and down they were told that a few times. And finally, we just got through to them and like, we Greg really loved that meeting. Like, can we please? Uh. And they're like, well, we wanted Greg to. Do, but anyway, so then we finally figured out the cloud passed and we started working on it. We did not expect it to be a hit. Uh, we were trying to make a classic movie, a modern musical classic. I thought maybe the movie has a shot at finding an, an audience. And I remember saying to my manager at the time who asked me what points should we ask for in the soundtrack because I had to share with other producers that had been hired and then let go throughout the process of making the movie. What should we ask for? And I said, Andy, it doesn't matter what we ask for because no one's going to buy the soundtrack to a f- from a family movie about a circus. It's just this, this soundtrack is great and I'm really proud of it. And I busted my butt on it for over half a year, but I don't think it's going to get noticed. It's the biggest album of 2018. Yeah. I mean, not just so in big. this country, but around the world. Yeah. Like dwarfing yeah. sales by anybody else. And I, I honestly was like, I think it's going to flop. It's cool to see that, you know, to, to see that as being as big of a success as it was and to continue with sort of the Alex Lacamoire. Uh, train to have Hamilton also be super successful, uh, you know, for that to be so successful shows still that that there are people willing to listen to stories and they're willing to listen to albums that are made to be albums. And if you give people singles, they'll listen to singles. They, you give them a compilation of singles, they'll listen to the singles they want to hear. If you give them a story, they might just listen from front to finish in the way that albums are supposed to be made. So it's Content. Not, not just a collection of records, but as a concept. 
I know it's a soundtrack, but it's a story. It's, it's a story. Everything and, we do is storytelling. Yeah. And they just had the yeah the commitment and the cojones to go. We're going to tell the story over the course of a two hour, hundred million dollar movie, and we're going to spend four years writing the music and you know dive off the cliff at this like. We, what is it? Is it our frontal lobe? Like, why do we need to know stories? Why are we such suckers for great stories? But we need to understand what our own story is. Sure. Why we're here. What does this all mean? You know, we're just, I don't think wolves are walking around the forest asking the same questions or, you know, worms or sharks. But we, for whatever reason, we have this more narcissistic uh, gene gumbo and we will always be suckers for a great story. So, um, you know, the music business, I could be wrong with this, but I feel like they hate The Greatest Showman soundtrack because it's not cool. It's not sexy. It hardly ever gets mentioned in the press. But he, Here, but in the UK, it's everything. No? It feels like that. Or maybe you know, it's just the stats. I just everything. took a bunch of meetings in London a few months ago, and in every one of those meetings, no one knew I was the producer of that soundtrack. Mm. It would come up and they'd be like, oh, and the whole tone in the room would change, you know. Hmm. Uh, it's not, because it's not a cool record, which is also part of the reason I thought it wouldn't connect with the marketplace. I just thought this is such a unique, specific thing. And I've never worried about being cool. I think being cool is actually like going the opposite way, like just doing right. something that's so kind of, it, it just is what it is, you know. Like when I saw you perform your musical, the whether it's, like it's just such strong content that it obliterates all those sort of insecure concerns of like, well, is this is this a fashionable, trendy thing that we can like turn into? It, none of that matters. Dear Evan Hansen's same kind of vibe for me when I see that. Just like the storytelling is just so incredible. It's, the it's book so of that. immersive. That's, that's the best book of a musical I've seen in so long. Of of it just Dear came Evan out right. No, not like the the actual like story of it. Oh, you know, oh, the Stephen Levinson's right. story of that. It's it's like when you see a, a room full of you know fifteen hundred people crying unanim like oh. a unanimous you know group cry is the weirdest thing yeah. you can experience in a show. <laughs> um, so uh, you know, real quick, I just want you to talk about. I know that you've you've been involved in trying to you you have the You've taken over the camp in France at Miles Copeland's, you know, uh, castle, and you have, you've been involved in, in creating music schools in Los Angeles, and I just want you to talk a little bit about, you know, sort of what you see as the future of, of you know, music in, in the world, and why you're putting so much effort into that, and you know, also to in the same sort of breath. Thank you for helping get some of these major names on the Music Modernization Act stuff. I know we needed the help and you were there to help out. And that was super appreciated because sometimes it felt like, you know, swimming alone in the ocean. It was nice. And there were other people there who were like, oh, here's a buoy. Well, that's a funny thing about human <laughs> so, nature. You know, human nature is such a quizzical thing. Like to watch you stick your neck out as far as you did. And go up against these companies. Uh, when you see somebody doing that, then the instinct is to raise your hand and go, "Oh, I want to help with that." But it's so rare to find someone who will start that race and be the, the that goose in front of the long triangle of geese flying through the. You know, yeah. it's tough. People don't get how scary that is, and lonely, and lack of support, and all of it. It's terrifying, you know. But you you felt so compelled to take that stuff on, and 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 well done by the Thanks. way you know and look what happened crazy I mean, the results speak for themselves it's incredible step, step one i mean there's this will be a Big really step. A, a, a huge huge step but it's it's about correcting that 60 year part of you know if we're talking about 1948 as a law to keep us from essentially unionizing and and determining how we get paid for radio play and if we're going to talk about a 1909 law for us, you know, that we just took head on with the MMA, mm -hmm. you know, these are not the oldest laws in the on the book somehow, but no one's going to tell me how I'm going to get paid in the year 2127 
which is 109 years from now. And no one's going to tell my great grandkids how they're going to get paid. Uh, it's our job to to stand up for those people. Those, you know, will be long gone. Mm-hmm. But I mean, it's just, some of this stuff is just not right. You know, we'll, and I think we'll, our we'll nature is that. creative people. And I'm just speaking for myself. It's like I'm inherently flaky with money. You know, I don't know what my bank balance is. I only know when I'm out of money. That's the one balance that I resonate with <laughs> right. when it's zero. Yeah. You know. Right. <clears throat> Which, by the way, just happened to me last week. What? It did. Oh. Like, it was almost zero. Because the way that I get paid as a record producer is, and I had eight projects that had not paid me over the last year. Some of it was you, over a year ago. just waiting for... So I'm not, you know, I'm like working on whatever I'm working on. And I've got five children and my outgoing reigns the same every month. And it's a big outgoing just to keep the plates spinning in the air and... And eight projects hadn't paid. And uh, this the same thing happened to me about seven or eight years ago. It was like five projects hadn't paid because someone hadn't signed a contract and people were on to the next. And these are records that have come out and like sure. were on the radio or whatever, having a life. And my team caught it a little late. And I didn't catch it because I don't pay attention to it. So I'm like, oh, my Amex is frozen right now because we don't have the money in the account to pay the massive Amex bill that I have to pay every month. You know, it's so anyway. My, just, I don't mind to, to distract with all that, but like it's tough being a creative person in the weird, circuitous ways that we do get paid because there's so many different income streams. It's not like you work for a company, you get one check every two weeks. Right. There's so many different paths that money shows up from, uh, especially when you're a songwriter, and I'm also producing records and. Uh, you know, as a musician, I make royalties on neighboring rights on in Europe and other countries in the world, and you got to keep track of that stuff. So we are sitting ducks. I am a sitting duck for people who want to rip me off. It wouldn't be that hard, you know. And I think that's why the music business has such a well-deserved bad rap because people like us. Uh, Although you seem to be more kind of clued into the business aspect of things. I, I don't have that neuron really firing in my brain. I wish I did. It's quite a feeble one if I have it. It's easy to stay focused on creative stuff and sort of like miss, oh, you know, whoops, I, I should have covered that or I should have. Uh, I think it's it's not that. It's the fact that when you, I know that we're tr- struggling having even music in schools on a in a basic sense, but... Entertainment is, in comparison to other countries, our best export. We're not even competing with other countries, really. So if we're not teaching, if, if our job in school is to teach how to survive the Industrial Revolution by doing math and science all the time, and we ignore the fact that entertainment is such a massive export for us, why, when you're doing theater class, would you not teach that and this is my sister's job at in at, at a high school in in Chicago right now. She made this job probably because she lived here. Why aren't you teaching these kids? No, you. There's a whole world of, you know, of of theater and and film and, you know, for music. Why while you're studying music school, why don't why don't they say in your music class in your jazz band say by the way here are some things that you can do. I mean. I remember my jazz teacher in high school giving me kind of blue and saying, write lyrics to this if you're going to be the singer of this. So, oh, okay, I can do that. And like listening to the melody, you know, wow. uh, and writing top line. I didn't know what I was doing, but if I'm sure Mr. Brame didn't know um, about top lining. But he, had he said, this is what... You you are now a top liner at fourteen. Then and I'm learning to write songs. That I'm writing by myself at home anyway to understand. Oh, that's interesting. That's what my profession is going to be. You know, I mean, part of the music school should be the music industry. So that way, even if it doesn't, you don't have to sit there counting your checks or your bank account. You don't have to look. It's not that. It's just understanding the basics in. What a what a point is, and why you fight for that point. We had this situation, not to go on like a, a tangent, but you know somebody wanted 
an, an extra whatever percentage of one of my writer's songs. And it's one of my writers, so I'm going to fight super hard to say, hell no. If it's me, I don't mind saying, well, we'll negotiate. But the answer is just no. You're not taking my writer's assets. It's how they get paid. You know, and to if you're going to represent writers or artists, you have to be the front line of that war. And writers are just so easily stepped on because we need releases and all that stuff. But if you don't set the boundary, then they will march right through your line. They will just go in and they'll start taking more and they'll take more. And it's like, it's time for our industry to sort of advance our line forward. And that's sort of where I feel like we're moving is to explain like this is this is what we're up against. We're up against billion dollar companies who who say they don't need us until we pull the rug out from under them. Say, okay, well let's see you let's see you battle this letter that Paul McCartney and Katie and all these people are signing. You know? Let's let's go, let's see what happens in the press here. We are really smart yet really dumb animals, you know, we're easily fooled by very simple devices. Like people that smile all the time. To me at this point, that's like a red flag. <laughs> that's me. really funny. You know, that's a red flag. Like, dude, something's going on here where you, it feels slightly predatory, you know? Um, m- making music is a very intimate experience. We have like, you know, we're in a room. There's three of us sitting in this room. It's like we're, you know, there are people that can do that in a writing situation or recording situation, but they're actually, their aim is to take over everyone else's career that's in this room and and steal from them. I mean, it's bizarre, it's really dark, but it's, you know, there's a book called Art of War which I have not yeah. read. Yeah. But Art of War says, you know, make friends with your enemies yeah. and uh, do all this, you know, stuff that it, whoever wrote that book understands what I'm talking about far better than I ever will with like the weird hiccups in our brain that feel like, oh, this is comfortable. This is the people that are stealing from creative people in the, in the music business, they just innately understand that. They right. get that people like me are kind of like, oh, you're a friendly person. This is a respectful environment. We're not going to screw each other over. You know, it's, we're bizarre animals. It's so weird to not get the penny drop that when you treat somebody else badly or disrespectfully, it affects you. Yeah. You're, you're, you're throwing, you know, you're, you're, you're polluting your own backyard. Yeah. We're going to go to this next segment where I'm going to list five things. You're going to just going to tell me the first thing that comes off the top of your head. This could be scary. Mm-hmm. Okay. We're going to start with the castle in France. Mm. Just like random whatever. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there really aren't any. Changed world. everything for get... me. Narcissistically changed everything for me. Can you elaborate a little bit? Uh, it's just so I've had 40 million sales of songs I've written at the castle. I have met two wives at the castle <laughs> crazy <laughs> it's true it's just been you know it took me from miles copeland inviting me there i wasn't really a songwriter the first time i went and kept walking around going why am i here what am i doing and didn't have that great a time and then second time i went back which is when i met carol who wound up becoming my mother-in-law because on the third castle she brought her daughter louise goffin as a singer songwriter to the castle, and that's when Louise and I, I knew Carol first. But you know, just meeting Carol King was like that was a total life changer uh, professionally with that song, and then certainly meeting her daughter. Now we have two children together, and she's Grandma Carol to those kids. Like, but it taught me Miles' belief in me as a young musician who was starting to become a songwriter was huge, and putting me in the room with people like Paul Brady from Ireland or Carol King or Mark Hudson or Gary Bird from Nashville, or just tons of people that I would not have had access to otherwise. Peter Murphy from Bauhaus, like it's a long list. How um, about Nina? Your so, your your. Wife, we met at the Nina? castle. Yeah, we actually met ten years ago at my studio for a four-hour writing session. Oh, nice. Um, I was working with Pink on a couple of things, and one of Pink's managers said, "I'm managing a writer from London." Who's in town for a couple of weeks? I think you guys would be a good fit. Um, do you want to try? And I said I have a four-hour window this one day, and if she can do it, that's great. If not, I can't. I'm just there's too much happening. She did, and we met, and the song wasn't very good. But by the end of that session, I thought, oh, who's this? Hmm. 
Yeah. Who's this? And uh, Louise and I had just ended an 11 year relationship. And so I, it was like two weeks before that. And the last thing I wanted to do is even think about women or meet anyone that was kind of interesting. And, and I actually had my back to Nina for the first couple of hours of that session because I had a little, like a, like a desk like that. And she was sitting on the couch behind me and we were talking, but I wasn't looking at her. And then we ate some lunch and I'm like, oh, I think you're one of the coolest people I've ever met. But again, the castle is what really sparked that because years later, she got invited by Sue Drew, who was running the ASCAP version of the castle, uh, when Sue was at ASCAP before she was a cobalt. And, uh, and there was Nina, and I hadn't seen her in a number of years, and our lives had changed a lot. We both had different partners, and we had a child with that partner. And, and uh, it's a long story. That's like a whole other podcast. But <laughs> uh, yeah, the castle was just like a total... Yeah washing machine of reinvention and, and invention. Yeah. Katy Perry. Brilliant sweetheart. One of the best songwriters I've ever written with. Everyone thinks she's handed a script. That is such BS. She drives. Yeah, how you were describing Celine earlier. Katie's very similar. She tells people like me, people like Max. She tells the producers what she wants the sounds to be, what the drum sounds should be, what they shouldn't be, a lot of what they shouldn't be. Uh, tells the record company what the first single is, tells her management who's directing the, the video. She drives, and she was like that on the first album we, we were making together. Uh, and, you know, I'm texting her right now asking her what's a good watch I should buy. Like, we're just, you know, <laughs> we're, yeah. we're friends. We just wrote a big Christmas song together for yeah, Amazon. Yeah, congratulations, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. We still work together. Um, uh, she's a good egg. She is so talented, uh, specifically as a songwriter, actually. She's an incredible writer. I know this is a weird one, but um, I know you've been working with her really since people started finding about her, and she's so young that Grace Vanderwall. Oh, Grace is a Grace is a volcano of talent. Yeah. And, um, and then the last one, your dad. Just random. I, you know, I, could, I could start yeah. crying. Let's start there. A huge influence, um, and I feel like... Probably what I'm trying to do musically is a sort of a musical version of the kind of message that he would talk about a lot because he was a very progressive preacher. He was in the early 1980s in a redneck town in rural Canada. He was advocating for ordaining gay ministers. He was saying women should have a right to choose. Uh, he was anti-capital punishment. All these things that did not play very well in kind of a blue-collar Working town, you know, he had a lot of enemies. We'd get phone calls at two in the morning from people that were drunk and furious, like, how can you, those gay people coming into the church? And, you know, they didn't have a bad Southern accent like I just did, but they were like angry and irate. And he would get up, he'd wake up and he'd talk to them for an hour. And he started a, a, a call in a free hotline for mental health. Um, it was his idea. He just he did all kinds of stuff, like helping people and trying to make the message of... He used to say this thing about, I'm not really religious at this point because I grew up in organized religion and I was a church organist all through my teens and it became a job for me. So I, I fried on organized religion, but I still in my own way, I don't really know what's going on, but I'm, I'm open to, I feel spiritual things and I love the idea of something that we don't understand that's bigger than all of this. But he would try to demystify all that and he would say people when they're reading you know, any religious readings, they get so caught up in the words of God, but they should really try to plug into the word of God and make it modern and make it apply to today. So he would rarely quote the Bible. He would talk about things that had happened that week politically or just in the news and sort of make it a, a live, trying to make these Allegory. amazing stories and parables real for today's mm. situations. And and he had this great ability to sort of like flick a light switch on to people, often through humor, but humor tethered to like really powerful truths. But they're sometimes, you know, hard, painful truths. Life's hard. It's supposed to be hard. Music is a very, very powerful, transformative thing. I still don't quite understand what music is, even though in one sense I know, I know too much about it. But I don't know what it is, you know, and I, it's changed my life and I see the power of it out in the world, um, look at Greatest Showman, you know? It, 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 it's easy to make fun of what Greatest Showman is, but it's 
great songs that are just telling the truth. They're not trying to be cool. They're not trying to do anything other than tell the story of the underdog in this movie. This whole movie is about underdogs and literally freaks who were shunned from a very racist society in like upper class New York in the 1800s. And, uh, you know, there's an interracial marriage in the movie, which I'm in one now, and that resonated with me. And just, it's a powerful thing. It's an amazing vehicle for storytelling, you know, affixing words to melody over harmony and rhythm. Can anyone show me a better idea than that? You know, it's the thing I chase every day. Well, first of all, thank you for doing this podcast. Thank you for having me. Um, you know, for for a a top liner <laughs> and for a songwriter to get to walk into a studio that has real instruments and more importantly, a real instrumentalist to play them is a serious pleasure because there's there are a lot of people who can play piano, but they're they're limited because of just either instinct or lack of education or whatever it is. But there seems to be no limit to what someone can write with you. And if you're in the room with you, you 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 recognize that. And you know, I know watching you write in a room and produce in a room is such a pleasure because you have such a knowledge of how music is made at, and compositionally you're pulling from so many different genres and you know the fact that we can talk about Katy Perry or Steven Schwartz and a in, in, or Pascal and Paul or Alex Lacamoire in the same way we're talking about Ryan Tedder or Aerosmith I mean there aren't that many musicians in LA that are concerned with music in so many different genres, let alone all the jazz and all that. But um, I just appreciate your intellect and your knowledge about music and your instincts as a as a producer and as a writer. And uh, this was enjoyable. Thank you. Okay, hold on. You're not getting off that easy. I am dead in the water without someone like you in the room. Like complete. I've got nothing. My toolbox. Is invisible. It's like it may as well not exist. In fact, that toolbox can impede and snuff out the flame of a great idea showing up. You know, so if if there's anything that I have a talent at, I, I think it's being an accompanist. That's what I started doing. You know, my dad's church, like accompanying singers, accompanying choirs. Um, if I have nothing to accompany, which is my role, then I'm like, what am I doing? I'm, you know, it's why I hate like tracks being made first and people sending out tracks. Like you're sending out accompaniment to a song that isn't written yet. What's it just seems, you know. There's a great Savin quote that I've mentioned a few times. Savin said, it's like writing a screenplay to special effects. And I mean, That's exactly you it. know, the more fleshed out that, that track is, the worse song you're going to get. But storytelling, <laughs> storytelling is yeah. the thing. You know, Absolutely. and 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 Steven Tyler from Aerosmith to Steven Schwartz, who mm-hmm. wrote Wicked and Godspell and lots of other stuff, to Otep, to Grace Vanderwall, yeah. to Chino Moreno from the Deftones, to whomever, to whoever I'm lucky enough to be in the room with. There, it's all theater in their own way. It's their yeah. own version of theater, and theater is just another vehicle for storytelling. It's yeah. storytelling. So, you know. When you sit down, Ross, and you're like pen to paper and you are doing your thing and you're emoting on the microphone, you are telling this really, or when I see you in the wrong man, it's like you're telling this story that resonates so strongly with you. You know, you're not pandering. You're not, you're not, we didn't write Small World from a place of like, oh, I think this might be a hit with this demographic and on Mars. Like we wrote from a place of we must chase this idea. So that's the only thing I, I listen for and wait till I feel that feeling and it can be like a little tiny little like bell ringing in another room or it can be this huge gut feeling in my stomach. But I got to feel like we're, we're, we're doing something that matters to us and if it matters to us and rings true to us, it's going to find an audience. Um, so I'm making a whole bunch of points right now, but I'm just saying that uh, it's really generous and and makes me all awkward nervous to hear you say these nice things about me but I'm telling you my skill set doesn't exist unless I get to you know collaborate with a really brilliant storyteller and then it's apparent to me what I can do to help that story move along but I can't come up with the story if I do it's not going to be very good you know well 
You came up with a story for the last hour and a half. I've been trying. <laughs> so uh, on that note, thanks. Thank you. For Thank you. This. All right, cool. <laughs>